We're live. Oh. That time. Load last lowest. The first, given that Gmail hasn't changed in 27 years, this is the first. It's because they're doubling down on Hangouts, right? They're, they're killing. Well, they've all... got nothing else. Like They're so dumb. They would they would switch. They would turn off every feature they have, and then one day they'd wake up and they go, we have no video streaming thing. How do I, oh, there we go. It's gone now. Mm. Beautiful. Beautiful. All right. Live. Are we tweeted? No. Nope. I'm tweeting. Hang on. I'm reading about how Prince Harry is going to marry Meghan Markle. Don't do that. On him. I'm happy for those two. They changed the law, apparently. I don't know who any of those people are. Which it's law? The Royal Marriages Act? The Royal Marriages Act. Why Why did they need to change that law? He just needs to get permission. Because she's a divorce. Because she got divorced. Yeah, but you just need permission from the monarch. Uh, it says here, thanks to a law change. Isn't he over 25? He's 32. Oh, he doesn't need permission from the reigning monarch. It still says they had to get a change. Yeah, the the, the chamber, the House of She's also Catholic, so they had to make a, an amendment to an act in 20... Good, that bloody time. Good. Well, it's so stupid that they even have... Well, it's it's no separation of church and state in the UK, so, you know, strange. Is that, is that the deal? The Queen is the head of the Church of England. That's so confusing. That's why, that's why it gets a little weird sometimes, and there's a lot of historical. Things. Well, she seems fabulous, so. She is, I and mean, she's seen a lot. She's seen a lot more than most of us will ever see in our lifetime. So. Cool. All righty. Do do do. Cool. Hey, we have lower thirds back, everybody. Look at that. Hey, low chat third. Stuff. Attractive lower Hang third right Hang there. On. Chat. Yeah. chat and things. Hang on. What are you doing, chat? I'm oh, I need the chat thing. Yeah, I'm learning the chat. Otherwise, Does I, I have I'm the blind. chat. Go to the YouTube thing. Hit pause. They have the group out. chat built in here, but I don't know how well that no, works. No, no, no. The YouTube, YouTube, YouTube chat, chat I know, in. I know. I'm we just saying. we got to go in there. we got to pause ourselves. Yep, yep. Do the whole dance. Overlays are back, people. Someone is upset that we've abandoned beards. I don't know about the whole. I have a we got the exact, I mean, I trimmed it. We are the exact same guy, though. It's we need to mix it up. Hey, hey, you have a lot more hair on your head than I do. I was wondering actually if I cut my hair to be bald, it would be three white guys with goatees and no hair, <laughs> which is taking it too far. It is a bit cookie cutter. It's a little bit cookie cutter. All right. Um, yeah, we need to get more guests. I'm telling you this, more guests. The problem is, it's the Damien Q&A show right now, and it's important because you have all the A's and we have all the Q's. Yeah. Well. So, speaking of Q's, I want to make sure that you're prepared. I want to talk uh, 2.0 roadmap. Is that okay? When we, you have that of link? Of course. There's a okay, cool. so that, that is my final you know, link. Maybe John could just lower his head farther into his lower third so that we could just eventually... <laughs> Disappear <laughs> like a, some kind of a Mario as long mushroom. As, can, as long as you can see my eyes rolling, that's you really something. Yeah, yeah. This is some episode of Super Mario Brothers. I have a setup. Can we talk about lower. Lower setup? Okay, Damien has moved the camera down lower. So the room got redone. This is a new table and there's a new TV, and I rewired everything. But I've ordered a shelf to put the camera on top of the TV. It's under the TV right now, which is why it's all the way down here. Um, so next week, hopefully it'll be up there and you'll look down at me from a, a normal kind of angle. But for right now, you have to look at my laptop back and look at the audio equipment and stuff on the desk. So I'm sorry, but this looks all right, right? It's not too bad. Mm, cool. Um, people are asking if we should switch this over to the Foundation channel. When yes. I started... Remember what I, I, I said, it's okay. all set up. So yes. Okay, good. Because I just noticed when, like I logged, when I logged in, they gave me an option. So yes. I don't want to do that, though, until we move all these over there. Do I don't do know that? if we have to do that. Yeah, you do. Otherwise, I have to update the website to list from both. All right. The website okay. loads from a channel. I'm All pretty right. sure you can do it in the Creator Studio stuff. I'm pretty sure you can just move stuff around. Can't you? Really? You think we can move between channels? I'm just saying that there's absolutely no qualifications or knowledge whatsoever. But it seems like a logical <laughs> thing that you'd want to be able to do. It would make you, know what you, could do? you know what you could do, actually? Because the, 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 the Dotnet Foundation is a nonprofit, right, John? Yes. You could add. You could it's put a on 501c6. You could put on advertisements, and then we could take the money from Google, and it could go into the .NET Foundation. So Google would be giving more money to the .NET Foundation. As long as we don't make a profit or something, I don't know. Well, it's not a profit. It's just ads, I guess. That's true. Could we all use right. it to buy uh, swag and give to the community? That's yes. the whole point. It's for t-shirts. T-shirts. Right. It's all the whole about t-shirts. All right, John, show yes. us some community awesomeness. I will. 
All right, in keeping with the standard thing, I'm keeping with not too many of these. And, and okay. scroll, please, if you don't mind, scroll slowly. I will scroll so fast, it will blow your mind. John, John, a bit of feedback. Can you scroll a little more slowly this week than usual? No, I have, I, all I have is a home and an end key. Home okay. and, <laughs> okay. Gentlemen. This is the uh, announcement post for the ASP.NET Core 200 Preview 1, what was announced to build, so here's a, there's a bulleted list of the big things. Um, one nice thing here, we've got a graph of performance improvements. So that is pretty neat. So that's that's kind of cool. That was called out. I in appreciate the, that that graph does not lie on the on the y-axis. On the scale, right? We you should, could, right? Definitely could. You could put. You could have the whole thing start at four hundred thousand. Lying is such a strong way. <laughs> hey, there's lies, damned lies, and statistics. <laughs> And I appreciate that the x, the y axis is legitimate on that one. So a, okay. few, a few things that Jeff called out on this. One is the um, session provider and output cache provider. That is pretty cool. In ASP.NET full. Four seven, yes. Yeah, full. Let, let's let's right. be sure to, de to delineate when we yeah. jump from one feature to another. <laughs> well, another thing, speaking of that, is just re related but near and dear to many people's hearts is WCF and how to migrate as you're going through things. And so he's he's included in here WCF. Also, again, full framework, but this is uh, you know an important thing people are looking at with containers. So he spelled that out. So cool. Um, here's also the .NET blogs announcement of .NET Core 2.0. So this is not just ASP.NET. Um, my links here in general, I'm kind of focusing just on ASP.NET stuff, but here, here this is important stuff uh, as well on, on uh, just .NET Core, et cetera. And here, talking about .NET Standard 2.0 and, and the increase in, in uh, libraries and APIs. Damien, Ooh, out of yeah. curiosity, mm -hmm. I assume that that 70% of NuGet packages are API compatible involves someone writing some magical for loop that yep. got all the S. Uh, got yeah, we, all did, we did some, uh, some uh, machine learning, some big data. And, uh, the for loop with a download. We, we rubbed a bit of big data on it. You yeah. called curl and unzipped them, didn't you? No, no, it's literally, no, it was actually a far more involved than that because it wasn't just download packages that targeted net 4.6 or, you know, net whatever. It was literally ingest every assembly from every package on NuGet, mm -hmm. um, essentially decompile them to find out what APIs they call and then build an enormous graph database of of all the APIs called, what packages they came from, and then from that determine which packages contained assemblies that would just load Ooh. if you loaded them onto something that called that, that supported Net Standard Two. That's now, legit. the thing that I will state is that seventy percent sounds super impressive. I would like to see us more publicly state uh, how many of the top downloaded packages. So, like that, that's just of the number of unique packages on NuGet. Seventy percent oh, of them are loaded, including right? my "Hello World" package, which is quite exactly popular. what I would what I, and what I would I, I would love for for us to say is like if you took the top thirty percent or the, you know the top eighty percent of downloaded packages, right? Because we know the curve on NuGet is insane, right? Because things like JSON.NET and Indie right, Framework yeah. long and long tail .NET, is long. The long tail is incredibly long. I'd love to see that. Statistic of like how what is the percent of the top eighty percent of downloaded packages that could that that would be covered by NetSender two, and I'm sure we could figure that out. If Imo, if you're listening, uh, that would be awesome. <laughs> cool, sweet. All right, moving on. Uh, so we've got uh, this is, uh, you know, the videos are out for build. I think all of them are out by now, or just about all of yeah, them. Yeah, I noticed that. It's one thing to point out if you scroll down a little bit. Note, there's a bunch of videos that have just gray boxes that look like they're a couple minutes long, 15, 20 minutes long. Mm -hmm. Some of these were recorded ahead of time mm. in, in, a, in a studio. Some of these, like if you look at support for ASP.NET Core there, uh, the one that's 13 minutes, 88 seconds, that's actually Maria at the theater. And the theater was on kind of on stage, um, you know, on the expo hall. And then some of them are, uh, are, are one hour long sessions. So kind of like note, that some of these are really nice. They're 15, 20 minutes. You can watch them during your coffee break and get a mm -hmm. lot of good information. We wanted to make sure that we had a way to get sessions out there that did not necessarily uh, you know, have an hour of content. Like, for example, Aurelia and ASP.NET Core talk right there. Just yep. by and talk about it. Great talk at the, uh, at the theater. So these are, yep. you know, make sure that you explore these. Because I know that sometimes when you look at a big pile of videos from a conference, it's overwhelming and you're like, oh, it's hours of content. It's like watching seven, se seven episodes or seven seasons of Dexter. Uh, this is not that. It's much more uh, ingestible. 
Yep. John, um, Darren says that you're scrolling too fast. Can you stop scrolling too fast, please? Scroll slower. John. I I only have the home and end keys. Well, then you'll just need to uh. hit them rapidly. Like this. <laughs> while you're scrolling, <laughs> while you're scrolling slower, if you could maybe uninstall forty or fifty Chrome Plugins. extensions, that would yeah. be great. Uh, I'm gonna install more. <laughs> How do you even function? You have more extensions than you have a Is it like, it's like looking at IE6 you know, with like 14 I would love to toolbar. I would love to do a show where I just show off all my extensions because there no are one some would amazing you extensions. Do that you don't use 70% of the top 80% I, of those I actually extensions. thought of that today as I was looking at these and I was like, you know what? I bet one day they're going to call me out on these extensions and I like you reviewed them. them. I, in I uninstalled one and I thought about installing two more. Oh my God. You have a problem. <laughs> uh, uh, let, me, let me point out one important thing about these videos, <laughs> which is you would think if you just go in here and search on ASP.NET, you will get all the videos. In my experience, no, it's not tagged well. did not work well. So instead, you actually want to go in and search for well, it. If you know the speaker, that works pretty well. Yeah, yeah, we need to go and fix that, though. We need to get the uh, of course the folks yeah. to fix that. I will get on that with. Uh, I, I just in, problem in, with Seth. Yep. In the meantime, if you just search for ASP.NET, uh, that worked pretty well for me. So, two two videos that I just have to call out. This was the one uh, where Scott, you and, and uh -huh. Dan Ross showed off ASP.NET Core 2.0. Um, amazing stuff here. Um, showing stuff on identity, on on the simpler. Yeah, this um, one was cool. We actually showed the new pluggable identity stuff and how from the file new dialog box, there's a click click a link. You can go and get other identity solutions. So we showed it was kind of cool actually, uh, Damien. We had it logged in with standard identity, then we switched to Azure AD, B to C, mm -hmm. which B to C. Yeah. Let Azure handle your logins. Yeah. And then we. With, and then we just like updated it to use Identity Server, mm -hmm. and then just like hit refresh, and then we got a different login. It was pretty. It was sweet. really cool. D yeah, Dan did some pretty cool coding on the fly. Here's one other part that was pretty neat at 44 seconds or 44 minutes, excuse me, where he went through and showed the much quicker load time. So here, I, I know you're not going to be able to That's see this. That's the, uh, the the startup time, right? Startup, startup time, time exactly. So here he's showing like it's roughly three, three and a half seconds, and then um, switching to two O, and he's getting you know under a second each time. Under a second, really cool. How did you do that? Most of that comes from defaulting view pre-compilation to on. Um, so that during publish, so that when you publish, we pre-compile your views, we, we remove the CSHTML files from your app, from the output, and we remove the refs folder. So you get a much smaller output size, and because we don't have to load Roslyn and then compile your apps, uh, compile your views and startup, you save many, many, many seconds on app start. So. Oh, yeah, he did show also, yeah, the much smaller size, right? I appreciate yeah. that that's a perf thing that isn't necessarily, like we do, we see a lot of things in the news, and, you know, the bosses like to show all the perf and go look how fast it is, but like, there's not just throughput. There's also startup and publish. Yeah, and I mean, the, the, we talk stuff. about before. There's like a, a spider diagram. You know what a spider diagram is, right? Sparta. A spider diagram. <laughs> spider. Spider. What does so like? You'll do spider? like a, a multi. Spider? A spider diagram. Spider diagram. Spider <laughs> diagram. <laughs> multi axis is. Um, you do. Oh, like, that was really good. Hang on. That was really extraordinary. Nice. Okay. <laughs> that was the closest thing I've ever seen to you doing an American accent. That was brilliant. That was great. Accent. Um, so you do. Uh, so you have multiple accesses of the the, the variables that you're trying to measure. And oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like spiderweb looking thing. Like spiderweb looking thing. And then you're like, so the mm. four that we we typically talk about when we talk about performance is obviously RPS or throughput requests per second, which is what Tech and Power is is uh, only concerned about. Um, they also measure latency, so that's the second one. Some, they do actually measure latency, but there's no uh, graph in Tech and Powerful Latency, but they do capture it and you can look at it. Then there's startup time, which we care about, which I've just talked about here. And there is uh, uh, memory use. So how much memory did mm. my application use in order to achieve the other things? Um, so those are the four things that we do that we try and have to balance because you can't just have everything, right? Like typically you trade off one to the other depending on what features you enable, uh, depending on how hard you compile, uh, all those type of things. And so by default in ASP.NET Core 2, everything in the framework is now uh, pre-jitted or what we call cross-gen. You may people may have heard us say cross-gen on stage before. It's basically the the new version of NGen. Um, and it uses a technology under the covers called Ready to Run, which is a less fragile engine, which means that we can uh, cross-gen the entire application stack, but if we have to patch 
one part of that stack, it doesn't invalidate the entire native image graph, which is how NGEN works. Every time you NGEN an application today, if you have to change any single part of that app, including all the way down to the framework, you have to NGEN all of it again. Uh, ready to run, cross-gen doesn't work that way. Hmm. The side of, so the benefit of that is it's pre-jitted, so you don't pay the JIT cost when the application starts up, which is great. The side effect is that it does drop throughput. And so we are working to try and balance those two things. You, you can choose, right? You can choose not to run on the cross-gen bits. You can choose to deploy them with your app instead. Um, but you get great advantages. If they're not with your app, you don't have to deploy them. So the, the publish size is much smaller. The startup time is much better. Uh, but you may lose uh, some throughput until we uh, do, that, do that change. Cool. I see this is also called a radar chart. Exciting. Cool. All right. Um, yes. Uh, so back to this business. Let me see. A radar uh, the, chart. Nice. Yes, radar chart. OK, so the uh, here's also the SPNet Core Signal R chart, always popular. Um, people are always asking for, for new stuff. So cool here. Also, just to point out on this, in case you don't know, these you're able to view the slides, and you can do view slides online. Mm. Uh, Did I even pick them up? Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And oh, so you know you can go right. through here and you can look at stuff like removing dependency on jQuery, which, as you pointed out, is a yeah. you know, big feature, right? So a lot, a lot of good stuff. It so, was kind of funny because we removed the dependency on jQuery, which then made writing all the demos much harder because <laughs> we didn't have jQuery. Right. And so I, I, I teased David about that while he was. Uh -uh. Yeah. All right. Uh, so here's a few community posts on stuff. Uh, Steve, Steve Gordon, who is continued to write you know, a lot of good in-depth posts. So he wrote, wrote one on getting started with ASP.NET Core 2.0 SignalR and looking at the main structural changes. So I'm, I'm unable to scroll through this at a slow speed, so I'm just going to move on. But there's a lot of good stuff in here. Um, Hisham writing specifically about the host configuration. And so here he's looking at, you know, this is kind of your standard uh, program, you know, startup and, uh, excuse me, program, and here's your kind of startup. Uh, and then he, he shows, you know, this is what that simplifies down to. So, um, you know, really cool, just a very short post, but really kind of makes it clear exactly what is being done with the new uh, hosting uh, default builder. Yeah, and so uh, to be clear, we'll talk about this a little bit later. Um, this is a first preview. Some of these things might still change. Um, the default builder stuff will likely not change, but some of the logging stuff that's being alluded to there, we still have some things we want to tweak there. So in cool. preview two, you might see some tweaks to some things. All right. Uh, here's a nice just, you know, we've continued to point out Rick Strahl's album viewer. So he's gone through and up updated to the 2.0 preview. Um, so he shows some specific things of, you know, here's what changed and didn't. Um, I want to point out one specific thing where he goes down here and he talks about, here's all the references he removed. So this shows the, you know, the effect of bringing, bringing in the um, meta package. Now, meta package, exactly. Will that, so. will that meta package thing be like that always? Is that a .NET Coreism, Damien, or is that a, that package of packages? No, no. So I mean, meta packages aren't new. Obviously, it's just a package of packages. Um, we th this is an ASP.NET Core thing. We've chosen to add this layer um, into the product specifically when you're running on top of .NET Core. Mm -hmm. So there's a new feature in .NET Core 2 known as the runtime store, okay. which allows us to effectively to pre-install. Um, the runtime assets from a NuGet package. And, I, and I'm being very specific because NuGet packages aren't just, oh, it's just an assembly. Like run, NuGet packages can carry all types of crap, right? You can take IntelliSense files and MS build targets and reference assemblies and runtime assemblies and native assemblies. Specifically, there is a, is there is a feature in .NET Core 2 that lets you take the runtime assemblies, the .NET runtime assemblies out of NuGet packages and put them in a shared location so that they're effectively pre-installed. And if you think that sounds a lot like the GAC, there's a reason for that. Um, so I have. Uh, Should we fear it and scream? No, not at all. So I've colloquially sort of referred to it as the new GAC in <laughs> the um, because you you basically put new packages in it and it takes the runtime assets out and it cross gens them for you when you put them in there so that they're optimized, they're pre jitted. Um, so all of ASP.NET Core is now in the runtime store when you install .NET Core two now. The way you use it is you have to tell your application during publish that you want to use that runtime store. As if you, you, you supply what's called a target manifest, and you say .NET publish, here's my manifest, 
uh, please assume that all the stuff in this manifest is on the target server in the runtime store, so don't include it in my application. Like typically, stuff you reference in packages ends up in your publish output, right? All the assemblies end up in your in your in your output folder, um, and we we basically automate that entire process for you inside that meta package. So by referencing that meta package, you reference all 180 odd assemblies or packages that the ASP.NET Core and Entity Framework Core teams ship. So you get everything that we ship out of the box and all the dependencies that we depend on, SQLite and StackExchange.Redis and la 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 la. It means all the API turns up in VS. You don't have to know, you don't have to think about where to go and find them on NuGet. You don't have to worry about what version they all are because it's just one version to worry about, which is the latest ASP.NET Core version, which matches the latest .NET Core version. So it's a nice unification of versions there. Um, and then during publish, we automatically pass that target manifest to publish on your behalf and say, hey, just assume all this stuff is on the target server because it's included in .NET Core. You don't have to worry about deploying it. If you don't want to do that, for example, if when you're running on full framework where we don't have this feature because the runtime store is part of .NET Core, um, then you, you can't use that meta package. In fact, you won't be able to install that into a project targeting full framework when we add back full framework support, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and you'll have to go back to basically what you see commented out here. We do have a smaller meta package, uh, which does cover quite a few of the packages there. If you look at our 1.1 templates, and you look at you know, Visual Studio, new uh, ASP.NET Core application, choose version 1.1, you'll see the dependency list there is much smaller than it was in 1.0 because we added one meta package that contains about 14 references. So it gets a lot better, but we really don't have a good mechanism on full framework for, for, for solving this problem given that we ship as packages. So, Cool. Thank you for the clear answer. Yes. No problem. All right. Uh, let me see. Two more, two more links. Here's a nice one from Mike Brand uh, talking about Razor Pages. So, Mike, you may have recognized I love the name. Razor Pages. So. Yes, yes. So, Mike was writing about. He was one of the like main authors writing about ASP.NET. Um, what was web it called? Pages? pages. Web pages. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so what's what's cool, uh, I guess it was outline right there. Uh, so what's neat is he kind of introduces it. This, this post makes sense to anybody. It's very clear. But especially if you used web pages, he, he goes through and explains kind of what's new and different. Is this like um, the case for Razor Pages? Uh, I think he makes a good case for it. So first he starts with creating a sample app um, and kind of walks through that. He does explain the simple development model. But then he goes through next and says, wait a second, I can use model binding and get better yeah. code. So right? I think it's fair to say this article is very much coming from the bent of I was a web pages developer, and this is mm. what Razor Pages does for me. Um, to be very clear, we did not um, design Razor Pages from that angle, right? Yeah. We did not go, oh, well, let's start with web pages. So, but we acknowledge that obviously if you were a web pages developer and you enjoyed using it, you're going to find a lot of things that you like. Uh, by virtue of the fact that it's a page-based programming model, right? Mm -hmm. uh, fundamentally, there are some big differences, which this article calls out and says, you know, there are better ways to do things. There's less dynamicism. It's we're not trying to be PHP using C sharp, which is fundamentally a dead end. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's MVC, so you get routing and you get model verification and model binding and all the good and tag helpers and like all the good stuff that you'd expect. Yeah, I, yeah. I went. Sorry, go ahead. Well, he does kind of, yeah, exactly. He ends up with, uh, you know, here's the goals and here's the non-goals. And I, I think exactly as you're saying, he kind of points out the the advantages that you get by running on top of the whole MVC system, you know. So I, I went in just very briefly, just because I feel strongly about Razor Pages. I went into my talk with Dan with the intent of, like, lighting the world on fire with Razor Pages. I feel that I did not do it justice somehow. I'm going to try to come at it a couple of different directions. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I tried because I really like it. Um, but, I, you know, I didn't quite, I didn't quite pop. I basically had two kinds of people. People were like, yes, this is what I've always been waiting for. And, eh, I don't get it. How do you come at it, Damien? So, I mean, the big difference between how I've seen you come at it and how you talk about it and how I think about it and what we thought about when we designed it is that I noticed that you tend to frame it a lot in the concept of for doing simple things. If you have something that's mm. simple, I have a website that's simple, and that is fundamentally not how we think about it. It's not a watered down, simplistic version of MVC. It is a way, it is a page focused programming model for when you're doing server side page rendering, right? So you are design, you are spitting HTML out to the browser. That's what it's about. And the there are certain, because that entire user experience is page focused, right? You, you load a document, you click a link, it goes to another document, you fill in a form, you post back to the form, it handles that and returns your result. It's page centric. 
Um, we designed a framework around that type of model and we looked at all the boilerplate that you usually end up uh, writing uh, based on the patterns that emerge from doing that type of development and we built a framework around it using the primitives that already existed in MVC. Like we invented very few new primitives to build Razor pages and where we did, we I think we made all of them work in MVC normal, like in typical controller view separated MVC. Yeah, um, I feel like that's that's useful, but still doesn't fit in the 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 trip the uh, the elevator. Yeah, and I and I'm not saying one is right or not. Like I'm simply saying like these these are the differences. And so I I don't go into it going I'm building a framework for simple blah. I go into it saying I want to build the best page focused server rendering framework ever, knowing everything I you know, everything I ever learned from doing web forms and web pages and MVC views. If I mm -hmm. wanted to codify that and you know, build a framework that really exposed the best of all those things, how would I do mm -hmm. it? And as a result, you know, we have helper methods and primitives inside Razor pages that just that don't exist in the way of doing things in MVC because they don't really fit well. But they fit really well when you want to do things like post redirect get, um, and when you want to do URL generation to other pages. When you want to do things like relative URL generation because you have two pages that sit next to each other in the hierarchy of your site, which is usually a bunch of files on disk. Um, and you say, I want to go from this page to this page. It's a sibling, right? So how would you normally do that in web programming? You would use a relative link, right? You would not have any slashes, or mm -hmm. you would have a dot slash. So that says, you know, stay in this current folder and then generate a link or go to the page next to me. Routing doesn't have any concept of that, but we have that in Razor pages because it's page focused, it's file focused. So you can do that type of stuff, but it's still routing, generating the URLs for you. So you get all the full power of routing. And the advantage of that, by the way, is that if you build it like that, you can take a folder full of pages and move it from one part of your site to the other and all the links still work uh, as opposed to you having a bunch of tilde slash links in there um, which may have been generated using uh, your uh, routing before but if they're tilde slash thus at root relative if you move that folder of pages they all break because you know the top level folder name has now changed so we looked at all those type of things that are common when you're doing page focus programming and we codified those in we got rid of the boilerplate we made primitives to support them well while building on top of the existing primitives that were there so i mean i, I spoke to a gentleman on the floor at build who had a similar thing it's like oh i like mvc it's fine i don't really have any problem with it and eh, maybe i'll use razor pages for something simple and i challenged him and i said look don't think of it like that i challenge you to go and use razor pages to build something that you would consider what you would normally do in mvc something more complicated um use it to do that uh, for a day and then make your judgment about whether you think it really is just for simple stuff because you still get the full separation you can still have the idiom the idiomatic approach is still to have a separate page model class which is fully testable supports dependency injection um, isn't tied to the html in any way you um, use properties for model binding you take parameters in you either take pr uh, parameters in through the methods uh, using um, model binding or use we now support property binding as a first class feature so it looks like you have two-way binding um, and they end up being a, a view model, effectively, uh, for the page as it's rendered. Um, and you can test them. You can do all the normal stuff that you would want to be able to do, and it's still separate from your view files. So yeah, I would just, I would just challenge people to go and try it. If they, if they still don't yeah. like it, that's fine. If they do, great. I love yeah. it. I hear you. I just want to get the elevator speech down, because I really think it's cool. cool. Thank you for that clarity. All right, go ahead, John. All right, last link here. I, I'm guessing this is where you may have wanted to end up, Damien. This is the uh, preview yeah, to high-level planning yeah. issue. Did I tweaked that yesterday. Was it yesterday or today? Okay. Uh, I think yeah. yesterday, yesterday. Yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. So this is uh, issue number two forty-three. This is the high-level yeah, planning. So what we're what we're hoping to do now is, I think we've had a bunch of feedback over the past six months, uh, well, three years really. Um, you know, part of going super open has one of the challenges we've always had is coming up with a good open process for planning um, because, you know, ASP and Core has many dozens of repos. And so you can't expect any reasonable person to keep track of issues across all the repos. Um, we've had roadmaps before, but they never get into any type of real detail. Um, so what I want to try and do now is we have this announcements repo that we use for high level announcements. So we say, you know, when we make a breaking change, um, when we move things around, like we, we make formal announcements in here uh, as it pertains to code and features uh, in ASP.NET Core. So we create a new label called planning, and what we're going to try and do is, is post one of these high-level planning issues at the beginning of every milestone. Um, so you know, the next release we're working on is Preview 2. So I just I did basically a brain dump yesterday. These are the top uh, high-level sort of uh, design areas and issues and work that we'll be doing. 
um, as it pertains to preview two. Now, obviously it doesn't link to every bug or anything, like there'll be dozens and dozens of bugs that we'll fix as well, but this is about giving people a, a rough understanding of the scope um, and direction of a given milestone. And hopefully these things are roughly in kind of impact and, and size or priority order. Um, and so people can use this to get an idea of what's coming up in the, in the next release and kind of roughly what type of work is involved and some of the decisions that we made and why. Um, the discussion for this is in a separate issue, which is what we always do with our announcement issues. We try to keep them very clean. So we put I, I update this as people give feedback that just to clarify things, but the discussion actually takes place over on, yes, that link there, home 2032. Um, yeah, and so as we create concrete issues to manage the work, you'll see that we've already updated some of these bullets and they link off to the actual issues in the repo where the work is happening. So for the people who want to go down to the next level of detail, if they want to actually get involved in the design or the work on a specific issue, uh, that's where they would go and do that. And you know, during this week, as we page those issues in, you'll see this get updated with links to do that. So this is my pledge. We're going to try this, um, see if this helps uh, keep people uh, informed about what we're working on at a high level uh, as we go into each of these milestones. Cool. All right. That's it for me. Oh, that was fast. Do we want to go through that line by line, or do we want to just... Yeah, it might, maybe that's worthwhile me. And to just do you want to share your screen, maybe, Damien? I mean, I'm happy to, and but you'll have to... I... You have it already up, John. Yeah, you have it all, up, right. Yeah. all right. It's on Here you. Go. It's happening again. <laughs> Boom. Okay, where are we at? All right, so yeah, so the big the big first item is, as I'm sure many people are aware, is adding back support for .NET Framework. We hit an issue late in the milestone, a preview one that uh, forced us to, well, we made the decision to to target Netcore app instead of NetStandard to avoid some horrible runtime exceptions that would have occurred otherwise for people on full framework. Um, and so we're going to add uh, that support back in preview two. This is a rough capture of the work that's required to do that. Um, and in cases where we cannot make new features work on .NET Framework, because there are already a couple of places where we've taken dependencies on APIs that only exist in .NET Core 2. Um, like uh, there's something in the new identity service stuff. There's like an error page where if we don't find a signing cert for the JOT token server um, during when the application is running, we'll show a developer exception page which has a button on it. You click the button, it'll create the cert for you in your application, register it in your local store, and then use it. Um, those APIs don't exist on .NET Framework or .NET Standard, so we have to call into .NET Core directly. In those cases, we can't do anything to work around that, so we'll just turn that feature off. The button won't exist on that middleware page. Um, Otherwise, we will uh, target Net Standard Two. Uh, Net, standard, Net Standard Two is the one, you know, the, the, the new hotness that we've talked about at Build in the last week and leading up to that. Um, and it maps to uh, .NET Framework four six one, which is the one that aligns to Net Standard Two. Um, and so you'll be able to run on .NET Framework four six one and above. Um, and then in cases where we can't make it work on Framework by way of just targeting net standard two, we will cross compile to net 461 if necessary. I don't actually think there's any way we have to do that right now. I'm certainly hoping we don't have to. I'm hoping we can just target net standard two and everything that we need to will work at least in this release, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, the meta package, as I mentioned, will not, the big one, dot all, will not run on net, on .NET framework because it requires features that are in .NET Core 2 itself, uh, namely the new runtime store. So the .NET framework templates, when they're added back, will not use that meta package. They'll use the smaller meta package. Um, what else? Do, 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 do. That's pretty much enough. Oh, and then we got to get the project tools to work, raise up review, pre-compilation, scaffolding, entity framework migration. Obviously, all that stuff has to work on .NET framework. It all has before, so that's not particularly problematic. Um, so what else? The next sec is the logger That's, uh, I mean, I just have to say, this is a non-trivial amount of stuff here, right? Yeah, I mean, exactly. it, it maybe it's, you know, it's, it's work, um, so, which is why it's number one. Yeah. Um, revisit the logging changes. So we made a bunch of changes around logging. Uh, namely, we uh, tried to deprecate iloggerfactory.addProvider because the interface was always a little mixed in its responsibilities, um, which made it difficult for logging uh, providers. People who wanted to complete replace the logging subsystem, like Serilog, were really unable to do that well previously. And so we added support for replacing the iloggerfactory um, and then added the provider-based support to our concrete logger factory implementation. Um, in doing so, it did cause a few issues. And so we're revisiting that 
um, and uh, discussing whether a different approach is better, namely looking at uh, supporting wrapping of iLogger Factory is a better way to do that. Um, if you want to know more about this, there's an issue logged in the logging repo. I need to update this to point to it. Um, the other thing we did is we added support for configuration-driven logger filtering. So we used to have this in 1x on the console logger only. But we wanted that support everywhere so that every logger provider could support having its uh, you know, log level verbosity and the logger sources that are currently being logged out to that sync um, settable live while the application is running by way of changing a config file or a config source. And so we moved that support into the root uh, sort of logging system, the logger factory itself. But again, we have some, it was a bit rushed and there's some things we want to change about that and we want to make sure it works well with the first item. So we're going to take a chance to revisit that and make sure it all lines up and we'll do that in preview too. Um, second, the next thing is the convention-based configuration, which I've talked about briefly before. We started doing this in a few places, so we did it for Kestrel. You can now set up endpoints in configuration, and we do that in the templates by default, so that your appsendings.json file has HTTP binding information for Kestrel in it. We do it for logging, as I just mentioned, and we want to start doing that in other places. We need to make sure that we um, agree on the approach of doing that everywhere, so that all the subsystems that do that uh, go through a common approach to defining their schema, that they compose correctly, so that if I want to use an options delegate along with a configuration source, like what's the proposed way of doing that, it's consistent everywhere, et cetera, et cetera. So we're going to do that as well. Um, the hosting startup feature, which is the ability now for environments to inject dependencies into the application at startup and have those dependencies have a method called on them that affects the application at startup. Very powerful, very dangerous feature. Um, we're using that to uh, for the application insights and Azure light up features that we showed during build. So you can deploy an ASP.NET Core 2 application to Azure. You'll get a little banner that shows up in Azure App Services and says, hey, you should use application insights. And if you click that, it doesn't like your application doesn't know anything about application insights. You don't have any packages installed. You don't have any code in your application or configuration for it. Just by virtue of clicking the banner, um, a site extension gets installed in your application in Azure, which sets some environment variables. And those environment variables are, are read by the .NET Core host and by ASP.NET Core. And by virtue of those things, they inject code effectively and have them run. And that's what makes App Insights light up in Azure. We're also using it to light up the uh, diagnostic streaming support in Azure App Service. And we have aspirations to use it to light up other stuff over time. And you know, anyone can do this. It isn't unique. Um, it's part of the web host and the .NET Core 2 hosting. Um, in doing so, as I said, it's a bit dangerous. So we need to make sure that we that we that we allow for situations where things mismatch. Um, for example, we might be trying to inject version A and someone else is trying to, but the application is already using version B. That can obviously cause big problems. So we're trying to make sure that we catch those before the application crashes. Uh, so we've got some hardening we need to do there. And specifically, Visual Studio uses this to light up the NVS application insights experience during debugging, which I've shown on the stand-up before. You've all seen that I hit F5, and we get all this great um, application insights UI in VS, but it's all the data is just in my debug session. It doesn't go to the cloud or anything, but I get all the logging from MVC and Kestrel and all that type of stuff, which is kind of nice. And we need to do a little bit of hardening on that as well. Uh, the next one is we have a new Razor Pages project template. We talked about that, but we haven't done the work to add all the identity stuff to Razor Pages, so we have to the templates, I should say, so we have to do that. Um, I mentioned the cross-gen uh, startup time stuff, but the impact that has on throughput, so we have some ideas about how we could improve that. We need to go and investigate those. We have a new thing called health checks. Health checks is... <laughs> I'm I just have to change that to package. I don't think package. Packageize is a word. Packageize is completely a word, because I said it was. No one can tell you what's a word and what isn't. Dictionary okay. is just, yeah, right. <laughs> so we're going to packageize health checks, and health checks is a new API you can use in your application that is configurable and pluggable and lets you write code that says basically says, hey, this is what, uh, these are the things that, 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 that pertain to the health of my application. Um, and then you can have external systems, you know, poll that, or you can have the health check system update a file to say, yes, I'm healthy on some cadence, for et cetera. You know, great when you're doing things in like orchestration systems for containers and they need to know whether the container or the application in the container is healthy. Um, so we have a thing, we've written it, but it's not in a package yet, so we need to do that. The spa services. Great stuff that Steve Sanderson has written for us. We need to update that to 2.0. We want to get those templates into .NET New by default, and thus individual Studio by default. You know, we've had a lot of great feedback on those. People are using them. We just want to make them a little more mainstream now. Um, Kestrel, we're doing work to make Kestrel edge ready. 
which means that we can remove the recommendation or the requirement that Kestrel always be run behind a reverse proxy. Of course, best practice is always defense in depth, and you should, uh, in, in most large deployments, you'll always have multiple layers of edge servers before your actual application server. But we're adding all the necessary features, timeouts, you know, request limits, those type of things, so that you can harden Kestrel um, against typical uh, sort of you know exposed web server attacks. It'll never be a fully fledged web server. It's not. So it's, it's an application server for ASP.NET Core. But if you want to expose it directly, we're going to add the timeouts and limits appropriate to let you do that with more confidence. Um, so, so that's something I'd expect in the like edge server readiness. That's that's the goal is for the 2.0 release. That's that's why it's here. Yeah. So that yeah, that's really okay. the big thing in Kestrel that's worth talking about. Like all the other stuff in Kestrel is really under the covers. It doesn't affect customers directly. It's more about pluggability for us to be able to have different transports, improve performance, um, using the new pipelines API, which isn't exposed in 2.0. This is really about the features that we and specifically the work we want to do in preview two. Like we have to continue this work in preview two so that we can uh, we can meet this goal by the time we ship 2.0. Um, being able to dynamically register ITAG helper components. So that's ITAG helper components are a new feature in MVC that lets you uh, have things that are kind of like tag helpers, but not really. That's why they're ITAG helper components. Um, be in, 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 in the ISC container or in the DI container. Um, and then they get rendered as part of the head or body tags. Again, Application Insights uses this to inject JavaScript uh, into the application so that it can do page view tracking. Um, this would add the ability to do that per request, so that in your controller or in your view, you could resolve a, an iTag helper component manager, and then you could say, hey, for this request only, I want to add this tag helper component. So rather than it being a global thing, you could do it per request. So this is what this is going to enable. Um, the finished security redesign, there's a link there. With, there's a large redesign of the entire security subsystem. Security is the whole thing to do with user management, uh, effectively you know, authenticating people and authorizing people. Um, there was a whole bunch of feedback from version one that we are incorporating into a redesign in version two, and we've been working with the community um, on that redesign. So that work continues in preview two. And then finally, there's a small item here around a design, uh, uh, establishing a pattern and an interface for design time service provider discovery which is around if you have a tool that needs to run at design time or build time, but it needs to understand services that in, are in your application at runtime um, that might be configured at runtime, EF needs to do this, Razor needs to do this, then we need we, we want to come up with a standard way of doing that rather than the somewhat hacky ways we've been doing it to now. Um, and so that's what that's about. Cool. Yeah. That's a lot of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and this is just the high-level ASP.NET Core 2 stuff. Obviously, .NET Core has its own stuff. EF has its own stuff. We'll, we have many dozens of bugs that we want to get fixed as well, but these are the, you know, the big-ticket items that are still outstanding that we've you know, kind of committed to uh, for the scope of 2.0, so we really, really want to get these done. Cool. Yeah. I just want to point out one, one thing here that's important, or I think is important. In this GitHub ASP.NET announcements, you'll see... Uh, down here, it'll say, I'm subscribed. I'm getting notifications because I'm subscribed to the repository. Mm -hmm. So I recommend clicking on this, like going in here and watch these conversations. This is a great way to get notified of these kind of big announcement changes. Um, right. This is an important way that I keep up with things. OK. Cool. Very good. All right. Uh, am I still sh screen sharing? I there, I'm not. Do you want to? Uh Answer some questions. Scott, John, did you want to go through and scrub some questions for me? Sure. You know? Let's see. Uh, Scott, do you have any? Scrub those questions, John. Scrub, scrub them up. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Scrolling through. I am going. I, I need to uh, answer the door. I'll be right back. But keep oh. going with the streaming of the live show. OK. Let's see if anyone's remembering the question hashtag. Not many people. So Ben pointed out that system.ben works on .net, and .NET standard 1.0. Thanks, Ben. Yeah. <laughs> Keeping that up to date. Um, let me see. Questions, questions. Oh, my goodness. Still looking. It's a pretty light in the watcher this week. We've only got 152 people watching this week. It's yeah. Week. Why. Uh, let me see. OK. Uh, Hisham asked, Sys, uh, Microsoft ASP.NET Core all is cool, but how does ASP.NET trim unneeded package in the case I don't want to include them in my package? I forget. I think you talked a little I about did that. talk about that. So that, that's by way of the runtime store and the publish target manifest. So you can you can specify all those things manually. You can build your own target manifest. You can add things to the runtime store yourself. But we ship with a default one, which includes 
everything that's in the Microsoft ASP.NET Core all package, which is everything we ship. It's about 180 assemblies and, and everything that we depend on. Um, and that's set up by default. File new ASP.NET Core 2, you reference that package, assuming you're running on .NET Core 2, um, and you don't have to worry about this. We just take care of it for you under the covers. If you don't want that to happen, you either dereference that package and go back to composing it using the individual packages, or you can continue to reference the big package and just set a property in your, in your project that will disable the automatic uh, specification of the published target manifest, but then you'll end up with 180 assemblies in your Apple folder. So, you know, cool. pick, pick your poison. All right, Nirmal asked if it's possible to host ASP.NET Core inside a UWP application. Yeah, so like, yes, except the, the, the big problem isn't ASP.NET Core, it's the server. Um, so ASP.NET Core from the server up, you know, it pretty much works fine-ish. Um, some aspects of UWP are very limiting, so you can't do ref -emit. And UWP and many dependencies that assume .NET Core or .NET Framework re rely on Refermit. Um, we use expression compilation for most of that stuff, and there is a version of that that, you, that works in UWP, but it uses an interpreter rather than runtime uh, code generation, um, so it's much slower. Um, but it will work. Now, the problem is the server. So I don't think Kestrel currently works in UWP. I haven't tried it in a while. This comes up periodically. It came up again during build, and we were going to investigate uh, what it would take. But we don't have any concrete plans for sort of supporting that as a first-class thing right now. Um, but if someone wants to try it, go you know, create a new UWP app, uh, you know, IoT or otherwise, and add the ASP.NET Core packages and try and boot it up and see what happens. Um, mm -hmm. it, we, we really haven't had enough feedback on that for us to prioritize it. Cool. All right. Uh, will authoring meta packages or other special types of packages available be available for third parties outside of the ASP.NET Core team? Say that again, sorry? Uh, asking about, like, so you talked about the meta package, right, for, for yeah. um, ASP.NET Core. So they're asking, is it possible for other people to author those? Yeah, as I said, like, there's nothing special about the meta just package. Just a standard just package. It has right? a bunch of targets and props in it that do all the defaulting of the build time settings. But they just call, they just set properties that the, the core.NET core SDK understands so that during publish, it specifies a manifest that comes with the package. The adding of stuff to the runtime store is a command. So you can go to the command line now and type .NET store, and then there's a series of commands you can use to add packages to the runtime store. And when you do that, it'll spit out a manifest file for you um, as a result of every time you run that. Um, and I believe there is some documentation coming on, on the .NET store and how you can use it. Um, but yeah, you can use that on your own servers. If you run uh, .NET Core on your own servers, you can pre-install uh, packages, either your own or stuff from NuGet.org, um, into the store on your servers. Uh, you can get a manifest for that and then start using that manifest during publishing so that your deployed applications are much smaller. OK. Uh, let me see. There's some questions here, but I think they're mostly answered. Let me see. Uh, OK. Cloudflare and other CDNs allow you to purge individual pages from cache. Could I build something using tag helpers and middleware to look for con to build lookup of content to URLs so that I, when I change something, I can purge it. Um, I've seen yes. people do that kind of thing using middleware. Um, I mean, certainly yeah. you can build, you can use tag helpers or middleware or a combination of both to call out to Cloudflare and purge stuff from their cache, sure, based on whatever credentials, you know, uh, the criteria that you want um, without knowing more about the specific needs. Then, But I mean, it's just code. Uh, assuming you're calling out to some system that lets you do that, yeah, you could definitely do that. Cool. All right. Uh, William asking uh, if system.drawing will be fully functional in .NET Standard 2. No. So the current plan for system.drawing is that it will not be part of .NET Standard 2. We, current, we have announced that we intend to uh, get a version of system.directory services and system.drawing uh, at least available for Windows. Uh, during summer this year, it's North American summer, so by the end of September. Um, uh, and then we'll, we'll go from there. Um, we know that those are the number two, uh, those are the number one and number two uh, areas of .NET framework that people often take a dependency on that restricts them from being able to move to .NET Core, system.directory services and system.drawing. So we have a plan to, to address that this year. Yeah. And we have highlighted several different things over time. Uh, uh, what image sharp and some other things. Yeah, so like if your need isn't that you need system.drawing API compatibility or binary compatibility, if all you need is I need to do server-side image manipulation, then you should absolutely look at image sharp or one of the other uh, open source uh, cross-platform managed image libraries. All right, let me see. 
Uh, I heard supporting .NET Framework 4.x. Well, I think this question's already answered, but I'm just yeah. going to read it. <laughs> I, I heard supporting uh, .NET Framework 4.x from ASP.NET Core with slow development. Is it just raw manpower, or is there a more technical reason? I think from your running down that big list of all the things that need doing, it's a substantial. Yeah, and if people want to know more about that, I would point them at the panel that uh, myself and Scott Hunter and Richard Lander and Imo Lamworth did at Build. There's a Channel 9 uh, open Q&A session that we did on Thursday night, I think it was. Scott, I think you did you highlight that in your blog post, Scott? Do you remember? I believe so, but yeah. I will double check. Uh, so I think, I mean, I think Scott addressed uh, a bunch of that stuff in there. I just point mm -hmm. to that. Cool. Uh, Oren asks, does the App Service App Insight light up work with Linux containers for app services? Not yet, no. Uh, we have aspirations to do that. Right now, it just works with the standard app service stuff. OK. Question, uh, individual user account authentication, does that work with ASP.NET Core Web API? Yes. So, there so is that's no... one of the cool things, right? I mean, yeah, that that's it... one of the cool things is that the, this change in the identity system now means we have a template out of the box that lets you do Web API with individual auth, because it includes a, a JOT issuing token thing, blah, 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 in, this, in, the, in the template to do that for you. OK. I think, uh, let me see, is ASP.NET, or, sorry, is SignalR available? Uh, they didn't see it in the ASP.NET Core 2.0 preview one announcement. No, because it's not part of 2.0. So if you watch the build talk, we make very clear that SignalR is not part of the 2.0 roadmap. It's going to come after 2.0. Our current plan is to have a preview of SignalR available around the time or shortly after we ship 2.0 RTM, right? the final version of 2.0. It is not aligned with 2.0. It will come many, many months after 2.0, as in the final release of SignalR will be some months after 2.0. All right, uh, let me see. Will .NET Core support self-executables ex self without calling .NET lib? Or, so basically, they want to call like my my XE dot. So they already we already support that. They're called standalone applications um, or self-contained applications. I can't remember which one the doc uses. Self-contained. <laughs> self-contained. Yeah, I think I always said standalone, and they changed to self-contained. Um, so that that's already supported. Uh, the experience kind of sucks though. Um, so that's one of the things that we that we hope to improve uh, moving forward after 2.0. But you can do it right now. You have to change your project. You have to like add some properties to your project. Um, and then you have to publish with some extra parameters. Uh, but when you do that, you'll actually get an executable in your output folder and like named after your application and just run it. Um, but it does tie you to a specific platform. You lose portability. You have to publish for Linux and maybe even a specific version and like you know, flavor of Linux when you do that. OK. Uh, several requests for me to show off on my extensions, but I'm just not going <laughs> to do that. Uh, OK, so this one, I'm not really sure what this means, but he's asked a few times. so. Uh, any sample of a spa without using a third-party library? No. Uh, I mean, what would you build it with? If you're not yeah. Use I mean, you could make like... a vanilla JS spa, but then it yeah. would then it would be a big giant pattern. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you took anything out of that vanilla JS spa and put it into your own utils.js, you've just written a yes a spa library. Yep. And we are out of the prescriptive spa library business. Yeah. Uh, let me see. Plans to make claims the holy way of doing things and get rid of .NET roles once and for all. Well, that's certainly what we recommend. It's, it, everything we show in ASP.NET Core is all claims-based, and it uses claims principle. Um, we don't really talk about role-based auth anymore. We talk about claims-based mm -hmm. uh, authorization. So, um, I mean, you're never going to get rid of roles from .NET Framework because we don't delete types. <laughs> yeah. um, but certainly in ASP.NET Core, everything revolves around claims and claims policy. All right, uh, let me see. How much of SignalR features will be available in the initial release? In the initial preview? Yeah, I guess. No idea. <laughs> OK. <laughs> uh, let me see. Uh, Enough question. that it's useful, hopefully. <laughs> will .NET Core 2 a preview 1 be included in the Visual Studio 2017 released version? No. Uh, no currently, okay. they are separate. You install. So the way it works right now is you install the 15.3 preview 1 of Visual Studio. And then once you've done that, you can install .NET Core 2.0 Preview 1, and that lights up this stuff. We've literally decoupled them. And so now you can uh, you can install daily builds of the .NET Core 2 SDK from MyGet or from the GitHub repo, and you don't have to update VS, okay? which is great. Um, the templates update, all the stuff, you know, anything that's in the daily build gets exposed in Visual Studio. Um, 
at some future point, we may put 2.0 back into a release of Visual Studio in a 15 dot whatever, um, but I don't have any details on that right now. But for right now, they are separate. One okay. requires the other, but they're separate. Uh, let me see. This is a pretty specific one here. Robert saying he has two installs of Visual Studio 2017 on two different machines, and one cannot discover tests in text, Test Explorer. It's for the same project. I'm Where? sorry. Send feedback <laughs> yeah. and use the send feedback thing, and someone will get in touch with you, and hopefully we'll figure out why. Yeah. Certainly can't diagnose that on air. I have no idea. <laughs> All right. Let me see. Uh, Seth is saying he just added the .NET Standard 2.0 and .NET Core 2.0 panels from Build, so they are on the Channel 9 homepage. Okay, great. Uh, any plans to support GraphQL? We've had a few questions on that in the past. GraphQL for the Web API story to complement OData. No plans from my team uh, immediately in the next sort of next part of this year to do anything with that. All right. Um, that's it. We're at the end of the list. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Cool. People feel generally okay about how things are going. I'm seeing some good comments. Some pe you know, people are talking to each other here in the comments, and yeah. some genuinely good stuff. You know, oh, some of these features are great. Blah blah blah, which is nice. People are answering each other's questions, which is good. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So some people. <laughs> someone was asking, "How does App Insights inject itself into the application?" Magic. Um, it's magic. It's the well, is it app insight? Isn't that App Insights does it right? It's that Azure does it right, or who does it? Well, it's the hosting. Both, but App Insights. We we added features in .NET Core two and in ASP.NET Core two, and uh. then the new App Site extension exploits those features to inject um, to inject itself into your application once you've gone through that experience in the Azure portal. Also, we we the ASP.NET team built our own site extension, the ASP.NET Core site extension. Um, that you'll also get a banner popped up for. So once you've deployed your app to Azure, if you go to the uh, is it the app settings blade, I think, which is where you turn on diagnostics logging and stuff like that, like you can log to blob storage. I think that blade now has a panel that comes up and says, oh, you're running ASP.NET Core 2. Click here to install their site extension and great stuff will happen. And if you do that, then all the buttons in that panel start working. So you can turn on diagnostics logging, you turn on log streaming, you can say, send my logs to table storage or blob storage, and that all works if you install our site extension. You don't have to depend on packages and run code, you know, add code to your app. You can just do it all in Azure, which is kind of nice. Excellent. Cool. Uh, I don't know. There's a few more questions that come yeah. out. Well, well, we've got a little bit of time. I don't All know. right. Uh, so Oren is saying, will you have prescriptive guidance around managing configuration across different different deployment techniques, containers, app services, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting uh, problem. That's one of the biggest areas of uh, investigation right now across all the various orchestration and deployment technologies, especially for containers. And uh, a lot of it pertains to things like secrets as well, like what's the best practice for managing secrets in an application? Because you really don't want them to be part of your development process or your build process. You kind of want them to live in the environment where the secret is required. Um, so we do have, we do have, I mean, I think the short answer is yes. Um, I couldn't tell you exactly what form it will take. Certainly, we have existing guidance around managing it for the sort of classic on-prem scenario. Like we talk about the user secrets package and features in our docs already for um, for development secrets, and we talk about using environment variables and you know environment-specific um, configuration files and things like that uh, to get stuff. But once you move into things like containers um, and various cloud uh, providers they often provide their own mechanisms for configuration. And what you'll want to do generally is either look to us to build a configuration provider for those mechanisms, or you know, build your own provider for those mechanisms, or have those mechanisms flow into something we already support, like a file or environment variable, um, et cetera, et cetera. So for example, in Azure, you can set app settings in the portal uh, using name value pairs in the, pa in, in the portal, and they flow through as environment variables into your application. And so if you do that, just by virtue of using ASP.NET Core, because we pick up environment variables and plumb them into config by default in 2.0, um, you'll get those settings. Right? It just works. And they compose over the top of um, any settings that you would set in JSON files. Um, so you know that works well. Um, for other things like secrets, we have techniques like Key Vault, and we have a Key Vault configuration provider for ASP.NET Core. The experience is a little crappy right now. Um, and we are talking about uh, doing things to improve the Key Vault experience. So, why, so that you know, rather than you having to like 
configure key vault in your application, put in a bunch of like strings in your app that map to something in the, the cloud, which is separate from where your app lives. Wouldn't it be great if it was more light up like, like what we're talking about here? Like you just add key vault or it's added mm -hmm. for you automatically once you deploy to Azure, it's added to your app. Um, and then the experience in the portal of you setting up Key Vault or the experience you went through when you published your app originally from Visual Studio did the work of configuring Key Vault with all the certificate you know, garbage and authentication for you. And then that was all just ephemeral in Azure for you. You never had to download those things. You never had to know what those certificates were. They just lit up in Azure so that those secrets were as, as secure as they can be because they only exist in like right at the very edge of where the application is. Um, and so we're looking at those full end-to-end -end flows and trying to make those as simple as possible. And they'll just continue to get better over time. Like it, it's a hard problem and we want to make it easy for people. But um, yeah, it's a good question. Cool. Uh, here's one that uh, Scott answered in the chat and I believe you've mentioned too, but it's a good question. It's come up a few times. Mm -hmm. Is it easy for other people to use, make use of this magical injection feature kind of stuff? Yeah, so as Christian answers in there, it's all by way of a new interface called iHosting Startup. So if you want to try this yourself, we actually added the ability um, for, we automatically scan your application DL, DLL for any instances of iHosting Startup without you having to do anything. So if you want to try this out, uh, add a class to your ASP.NET Core 2 application, implement iHosting Startup, okay? That's the new interface. There's one method on that called configure, and you will be passed an instance of an iWebHost builder. So you can only do things to the application using this hook that you would be able to do during iWebHost, like that phase of building the web host. But you can do a lot, right? You can you can affect the DI container, you can, you can affect logging configuration, you can affect uh, the configuration provider configuration. You can register an iStartup filter. So iStartup filters are classes that live in the DI container and then are executed during the startup of the application during the configure phase. So that's usually where you set up middleware and things like that. You can't compose middleware. Middleware composition, that means like the order that middleware runs is owned by the application. You can't get a list of the middleware and then inject yourself in at number three. Like that's just not a thing. It's probably never gonna be a thing, but you can register a startup filter. You can't control what order the startup filters run in, but if you just care that you're somewhere in the pipeline, you can add uh, middleware via an iStartup filter. But as I said, there's a lot of caveats there. You can't do an awful lot with that. Now, um, that said, if you want to observe things that are going on, we have these things called diagnostic sources, uh, which kind of are, are little places inside ASP.NET Core that spew out live information while the application is running. And it's not just tracing information. We give you live objects. So for example, you can write a diagnostic source listener that gets access to the HTTP context every time a request starts. So think about what you could do uh, as a cross-cutting concern in your application if you did that. That's how application insights and other, other tracking uh, mini profiler, things like that, log and inspect what's going on in your application. They write a diagnostic source listener and they get access to the context while it's happening. Um, so yeah, if you want to try it out, try it out. We implement iHosting startup, stick it in your application, start up your application, you should find your code gets called. Um, if you want to go as far as injecting in extra dependencies, right, which is a little crazy. So if you, if you want the iHosting startup to be separate, to your application. You want it to have your application have no knowledge that there's this startup code, which is what we're exploiting. That requires quite a bit more work. So you have to have an environment variable set that points to a depth file um, that the .NET host reads, and then that, that depth file gets merged with the application's depth file and the shared framework depth file, and that's what adds basically NuGet packages to the application at runtime. And then another environment variable you can set is the one to tell ASP.NET the name of the assembly that contains your class that implements iHosting startup so that we can find it and then we'll call the method on it. And usually you use those two things together to inject code and have it be called during application startup. That's what we're doing in Azure with application insights. Now all that code is there, it's all open source. You can see how we wrote it all, it's all in the Azure integration. GitHub I was just gonna point that out. I'm yeah, looking through so the code, it's all there. Yeah. If you are. If you are so inclined, and it is not for the faint of heart, anyone who ever tried to use the pre-application start events in IIS mm -hmm. and ASP.NET 4, you can royally screw up your app doing <laughs> this stuff, right? Because you're getting in super early and just doing stuff and just assuming it's going to be fine. And now you're going as far as like injecting assemblies effectively into the application. So you have to be very, very careful. But if you know what you're doing, you can you know, set stuff up once on a server and have every application on that server, or at least the ones you configure with the environment variables, get benefits of that, so. Yeah, and like you said, that's GitHub, ASP.NET, Azure integration. Yeah. All the, all the code there. Cool. Uh, 
Uh, I mean, there are some more questions coming in, but people have generally been answering each other, so that's that's pretty nice. Cool. Uh, All right. Yeah, I don't think anything else necessary. Scott, you got anything insightful to add? Do you want to prompt a new discussion, or are we? Nope. <laughs> I, mean, I could I could prompt stuff, but it's just going to take us hours and hours and hours. We I got it. Fair enough. It's been a few weeks. weeks. When we do a solid, when we do a solid hour plus. Yeah. We got to call it. Otherwise, we'll be here all yeah. day. So I will say I do plan. Uh, we are rolling out ASP.NET Core 2 Preview 1 to Azure right now because it didn't make it last week. We missed the the boat for that, unfortunately. So that's happening right now. Um, when that has finished, I'll let people know. I'll tweet it and stuff. And then once that happens, I plan to update live ASP.NET website. Um, it'll probably take me a couple of hours, so I'll, I'll probably just give you 10 minutes notice one day and I'll jump on Hangouts, and uh, if anyone wants to watch me fumble around and use my own product for a couple of hours and swear, then I encourage you to do Highly recommended. That's a lot I of fun. I do have one question, actually. Yeah. Uh, because I was out of town, I was not responsible this time for updating the dot, dot .NET website. It does not appear to be, you can't get to the dot .NET core download from anywhere. Yeah, like you can't get to the preview link. Do we yeah. want that up front? I mean, basically, you have to know the URL, and that's yeah. so. I think, cheesy. yeah, I think Hunter might have made a call about that. I'm not sure. He wants you to find it in a social way, which implies that is that what are. it is. So it's I funny. Think, because, I think. I think. Okay. Go on. I think that the intent is that you don't want people to bump into it and hurt themselves. Yeah, I mean, it does seem odd though. That one, I would call it alpha a, one if it were we me. We can't come up with a way that makes it obvious that if you're interested in previews, like Visual Studio, mm -hmm. does, right? if you go to visualstudio.com, yeah, we have a link to the preview stuff from there. I'll bring it up with the folks, the powers that be, because I feel it's a little bit cheesy. I've gotten that feedback too, mm -hmm. and so I think it's worthwhile. At like least you should be able to just that. go. And just it should just be obvious, but it's it not obvious. It is interesting. Obvious. Like on the Visual Studio website, I don't see any obvious links to previews at all. It seems to be very similar, a similar yeah. thinking over there. So anyway, you bring it up with the people who are paid more than us. I will take care deserve. of it. Okay. Yep. Cool. Shiny. Yep. Uh, all right. Awesome. Chromatic zoom out new location new edition. edition. Engaged. Hang on. Oh, not engaged. Go ahead. Engage again. Engage. It's so dramatic. That's really a short throw. Uh, I went back and then and you back up. That was really good. <laughs> that was good. Your head is really small. Dude, pretend like you're typing because you look like a little tiny person on a giant laptop. 